Hello, my name is Raji Steinek. I'm a professor of Japanology at the University of Zurich. Um, and I'm very happy to be part of this conference. I am currently on the road, so a little bit more informally dressed than usual and also in a kind of improvised surroundings. My main interests in research are in Japanese intellectual history, the history of philosophy in Japan, and the history of time in Japan. And my talk for this conference brings all of that together because I'm looking at how Zen became philosophy using a very famous text by Dogen, today considered the founder of the Soto School of Zen in Japan, who lived from 1200 to 1200. 53, um, a famous text by Dogen on time as an example of what happens when texts from the Zen tradition are read as philosophy. I'm using the theory of translation, a model from translation studies, to identify the shifts that occur on these kinds of reading. Especially when philosophers approach Dogen with the assumption that he was a fellow philosopher. The theory of the frames of equivalence from translation studies can help us to identify what happens in these readings um, on the semantic level, but also on the syntactic level and on the pragmatic level. And I think it is really important that we consider all these three dimensions of the semiotic process when we analyze this process of transformation from Zen into philosophy. So what I'm saying is that major shifts occur not only on the level of meaning, which is perhaps the level we are most interested in, but also on the level of syntactic and syntactic dimension of the process. So in the way these texts are built and put together and on the pragmatic level so on the level where the relationship between the author or communicator and the audience are concerned and this theory of the five frames of equivalence that i'm using in my paper a theory from translation studies can help us to identify and analyze these shifts. My point is partly that when texts, when Dogen's texts are read by philosophers under the assumption that Dogen himself was a philosopher, many of these texts occur inadvertently or maybe not in inadvertently, but they are not explicitly addressed as such. And I think when we as scholars want to talk about how to understand Dogen, it is really important that we know what is happening, what is going on uh, when we refer to his texts. Obviously, one of the assumptions I am working from here is that Dogen was not a philosopher. And that may need some explanation. Especially because I myself a long time ago also referred to Dogen as a philosopher. And what convinced me otherwise was that I started to uh, become more involved in looking at the way that Dogen's texts are actually 
composed and the rhet rhetoric they used. And in the course of, of that kind of research, I also looked into the way Dorgan expresses in his texts what he is actually doing and the, the names that he uses, the terms that he uses to identify his own project and to identify other projects, so to speak. And what I found is that Dogen clearly identifies what he himself is doing with the Buddha way and that he never uses any of the terms that we might consider to be equivalents to philosophy, terms such as Do, the way, or Kyo, the teaching, or Ken, the view, in a neutral fashion. So Do and Kyo are either the Do and Kyo of the Buddha and of that what he is doing, or they're always combined with derogatory terms. So everything else is just deviant, wrong, misleading, and so forth. And there is no hyperonym, no general category under which they all belong. So everything else, everything that is not the Buddha way, not the Buddhist teaching, is in a way just of a different kind altogether. And Dogen also actively discourages his disciples, his audience, to ever engage with these other teachings or ways or views. And I think that is really an important difference to philosophy as we generally understand it, because philosophy is about the critical scrutiny of concepts and of conflicting views. And even if you disagree with that understanding, I think it is quite clear that the philosophers who have read Dogen and understood Dogen to be a philosopher were working from this notion of philosophy. And what I'm showing in my paper is how that understanding of the prominent readers that have introduced Dogen as a philosopher into philosophy is impacting on the way they read his texts. So if we accept that Dogen was working um, from a different standpoint than what his philosophical readers understand philosophy to be, then it makes sense to see philosophical readings of Dogen as a kind of transposition from one field, the Buddha way, to another, that is philosophy. And in that regard, it makes sense to look at the theory of translation, what has been developed in translation studies, to understand what's going on in this process. And one theory from translation studies that I found particularly helpful in this regard is the theory of the five frames of equivalence. So translation comes the, uh, with the idea that you have a certain text in a given language and you are trying to produce some sort of equivalent in another language. Um, the question now is, what actually does define equivalence? And Werner Koller, a German Nordist, who looked at translations, let's say, from, for example, from Swedish literature into German and vice versa, has argued that translation isn't simply about producing a text with the same meaning, if only because meaning already has various levels. But the equivalences in question belong, mainly speaking, broadly speaking, to five different frames. 
The first one, the most obvious one, is the denotational. So on the level of references, you want a text to say, the translated text to say basically the same thing, talk about the same things and make the same propositions about these things than the original text. But then there is obviously also a second layer to the semantic dimension, and that is the layer of connotations. And as I demonstrate in my paper, already the translation of the title of Dogen's texts, Uji, or in the pronunciation that was more common um, in older manuscripts, Yuji, Already the translation of the title poses problems on both of these levels. Because when philosophers have read Dogen and especially this text, Uji, many of them have chosen to identify the first part of the term Uji, uh, which can also be uh, read Aru in Japanese. Uh, with being, and the second part, ji or toki, with time. Now, as Rolf Elbefeld has shown in his monograph on um, the phenomenology of time, and especially Dogen's text Uji, um, he argued that the u or u of Uji actually does not denote being as such, but it denotes something that is there. So something real. And the example that Dogen uses in his texts are uh, various from Buddhas and um, other superhuman figures to um, bamboos. So various things that or things that exist. On and obviously that's a different kind of denotation than to identify you with uh, being an abstract concept. A second shift in meaning when Uji is identified as a combination of being and time is that in the context of 20th century philosophy, it immediately uh, evoked an association, a connotation with Martin Heidegger's famous book on uh, time that is Sein und Zeit, being and time. And as I demonstrate in my paper, this connection was immediately made already by Akiyama Hanji and later by Tanabe Hajime. And um, it evoked a certain form of reading Dogen's texts. So, in terms of the dimension of the semantic, it is not only the denotational level, the direct reference that is important, but also the connotational level um, or the connotational frame. So what kind of associations are evoked and then further employed when um, making a translation or in our case, making this transposition from the Buddha way into philosophy. Then there are two further frames of equivalence that belong to the syntactic dimension of the semiotic process. And that is um, the text normative frame and the formal aesthetic frame. For example, Akiyama Hanji, uh, when he speaks about the text Uji, he does so in a, the context of a larger part of his book that is on Dogen's ontology. And by in doing so, he groups it together 
with uh, a number of other texts that also speak to, um, let's say, the way reality um, is built according to Akiyama's interpretation of Dogen. And this grouping obviously is not a grouping made by Dogen himself, who never wrote a tract on what is reality, um, or grouped the texts that he wrote in such a manner that one group is about ontology, and then there is another group of texts about practice. Uh, this is a grouping that comes from the Western tradition of philosophy, and that is then projected onto Dogen's texts. And another frame that belongs to uh, the le di syntactic dimension is the formal aesthetic frame. And here you can see how philosophical readers of Dogen have very often transformed his highly metaphorical language, for example, into um, a set of propositions in rather abstract terms. Finally, there is the frame of pragmatic equivalence, where the dimension is concerned of the relation between the author of the text and their audience and what the author tries to achieve yeah, by way of their communication with the audience. Obviously, this is also an important frame of equivalence when you consider translated texts, or in our case, the transposition of a text from Zen into philosophy. And there is a fundamental difference. As Griffith, Falk and others have shown, a lot of the communication that happens within the Zen tradition only makes sense if you presuppose, if you grant that the person who is making an expression that is later on used as a koan, for example, speaks from the position of the enlightened master. And the enlightened master does not have to explain himself or herself and is not expected to. Um, whereas in philosophy, the dominant paradigm in the pragmatic dimension is that as a philosopher, you speak to a community of equals who then um, can scrutinize what has been said in the light of other propositions. And I find this dimension of the pr pragmatic and what happens when Dogen is read as a philosopher um, highly important in this regard because very often what happens when Dogen is read as a philosopher is that this position of the enlightened master is kind of sneaked into the discourse of philosophy. So Dogen must be right because he was enlightened. And then we are not supposed to critically scrutinize what has been said. And I find that so problematic, especially because of all the other shifts that have occurred in the other frames of equivalence. Because in many instances you can see that on the denotational and connotational level, what happens is that philosophical readers read their own theoretical predilections 
into Dogen's texts. And then their own philosophical positions are in turn invested with the enlightened authority of Dogen. And I think that this is a pragmatic shift on the level of a philosophical reading of Dogen's texts that is highly detrimental to philosophy. Whatever you think about the Zen setting with the enlightened master in, let's say, for example, the context of a Zen monastery where people have chosen to enter that kind of community and follow that path. In my paper, I use mostly Akayama Hanji's monograph, Dogen no Kenkyu, which was among the first um, extended philosophical expositions on Dogen. Um, and then, obviously, Tanabe Hajime's famous Shobogenzen no Tetsugaku Shikan, my private views on uh, the philosophy of the Shobogenzo but also a more recent article by Rain Rod on um, Uji, and which he translates as the existential moment. Uh, there are many more examples to be explored. I hope that you find this approach with the five frames of equivalence helpful also when um, dealing with other texts. I'm convinced that it can help us really to identify what is going on in different readings of the source texts we are interested in. So I hope you'll have find the time to have a look at my paper and you enjoy the examples and I'm looking forward to discussing it with you later on in this conference.